Assalamu alaikum, good morning, good afternoon, or good evening, depending on the world, where in the world you're from. Welcome to our Future Belongs to the Tropics webinar series. This webinar series celebrates the tropics and highlights the importance of science and technology in the region. It is also a lead up to our International Conference on Tropical Sciences that will be jointly organized by the Mojave Science Award Foundation and the Academy of Sciences Malaysia in October 2021. Today, we are celebrating World Bamboo Day with a webinar on sustainable housing for the tropics. We have some excellent speakers, so stay tuned. And if at any point you want to ask questions, please type them in the Q&A function at the bottom of your Zoom. Now, without further ado, let's get this webinar started. To start the webinar, we have some welcome remarks from Professor Emerita Maslan Othman, trustee of the Mahade Science Award Foundation, Chair of TROPSCI 2021, and Senior Fellow of the Academy of Sciences of Malaysia. Professor Mazlan, the floor is yours. Thank you, Alia. I think I'm unmuted. Yes. Um, ladies and gentlemen, um, I too uh, would like to um, give you a very, very warm welcome to this uh, webinar. Um, and with the theme, the future belongs to the tropics. So yes, you heard Alia say that this webinar series is a lead up to the International Conference on Tropical Sciences, which will be held from 25th to 27th of October. It is co-organized by the Mahathir Science Award Foundation and Academy Science Malaysia. Now in the past, in the last uh, one and a half years, maybe all, uh, two years, um, we've had a number, the, the, we have had this webinar series where we, had, we explored various subjects, uh, mangroves, youth, health, mountains, cities, forests, all related to the tropics and even coffee. Um, so, but the subject we are going to touch on today relates to one of the Mahade Science Award categories, which is tropical architecture and engineering. Now, the sunny, hot, and humid climate of the tropics require unique and special solutions to almost all of our problems. Um, but one way this humid climate is advantageous is that it is optimal for growth of certain plants. And I'd like to remind everybody that um, the tropics holds approximately 80% of the world's biodiversity. One such plant is the, is bamboo, I think you saw the videos we showed you beforehand, which is a grass, and maybe Eugene will say more about that. Now, bamboo, as you know, is mostly native to tropical regions. It's extremely versatile. You see the explanations from our experts. Um, it has economic and cultural significance. Um, you'll hear from our experts today that with proper treatment, bamboo can last almost a lifetime. And therefore, we will perfect as a building material uh, for the developing world. Why? Because in, in addressing SDG 11, uh, which targets the provision of adequate and affordable housing, bamboo um, is a no-brainer, provides a strong, practical, and cost-effective building material that can help deliver and secure affordable housing to the world's poor. And remember, we, we've said this before, that 85% of the world's poorest people live in the tropics. So what better way to address the housing needs of these people than with sustainable building material from a plant that thrives in the region. So the potential of bamboo needs to be tapped further. It's not, it's not as well developed in some countries um, so that we can address the needs of the many, not the few. So I hope that today's experts will galvanize the adoption of bamboo in a broader fashion for sustainable and affordable housing in the tropics. So without further ado, I leave you in the hands of our esteemed moderator for the day, Yu Jin Lo. He is an architect and a bamboo advocate. He is the founder of Better Bamboo Buildings. Yu Jin, over to you. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Sri Maslan. Thank you and welcome everyone. Good morning and Selamat Pagi. I know that there are bamboo folks tuning in and also that there are many attendees today that are looking at bamboo and its narrative. We welcome all of you. 
Today, our focus is on sustainable housing in the tropics, specifically in bamboo. And after having gone through all the speaker slides, I know that you will really enjoy and hopefully also pick up some useful bamboo information and directions from us. Why bamboo? And how do we make sustainable housing out of this material that has been referred to as golden grass or green gold? Can bamboo houses actually work? And how long will they last? What are the strong points for using bamboo and also the pitfalls for working with bamboo that we need to watch out for? How can bamboo rise and move us sustainably into the future? This morning, we are privileged to have a host of prominent bamboo practitioners and advocates who are experts in their own field to speak and share their bamboo experience and journey with us. In the bamboo world, we have the luxury of giving our talks for over 40 to 60 minutes. Why? Because bamboo is re-emerging. It is exciting and there's also so much to share. But for this event, we, the speakers, have tried hard and compacted our presentations for you so that we can convey them in the contemporary short and sharp bites that audiences prefer nowadays. So without much ado, I'm going to introduce our first speaker. Um, his name is Ahmad Maslan. And Ahmad Maslan is going to speak about the durability and preservation of bamboo. Engineer Major Ahmad Maslan is a bamboo promoter and expert in Malaysia. He is currently an advisor to the bamboo, Malaysian Bamboo Society and immediate past president. Ahmad Maslan holds a bachelor's degree in civil engineering as well as a master's degree in structural engineering. In addition, he has undergone extensive postgraduate programs in the US and the UK. Today, he is recognized as a structural engineer in Malaysia and serves as the director of Isan Team Consultants in Rian Berhad. As part of his work, he also lectures part time at selected universities and is also involved in RD programs relating to protective structures. Maslan is also a practicing civil and structural engineer and has been so for more than 30 years. Bamboo has taken him to many countries, including China, India, Vietnam, Thailand, Korea, Philippines, and Indonesia. One of his happiest bamboo moments, if you like, is fabricating his own bamboo bicycle, which he derived much satisfaction. Given his background as a practicing structural engineer, Engineer Ahmad Maslan is able to combine his engineering expertise with his love for bamboo to design and build beautiful bamboo buildings, namely Masjid Bulu Kuala Kangsa, a bamboo resort in Taiping, and the Taiping Bamboo Clock Tower. So on to you, Ahmad Maslan. Hi, good morning. Uh, thank you, Eugene. And thank you also to Dr. Sri Dr. Mazan Osman and the organizer for inviting me to, to share my uh, small knowledge, little knowledge and experience on bamboo uh, this morning on the very uh, World Bamboo Day today, 18 September. Yeah. So, uh, so within 20 minutes, uh, the moderator already warned me not to exit <laughs> because we, we can speak very long, but yeah, we have to limit our speak to 20 minutes. I will share my screen now. Okay, sorry. Go back to. Okay, I got the first, yeah, first. So I will talk about durability and, and uh, preservation of bamboo. 
Okay, with bamboo, it's endless innovation. Bamboo, the green goal, the gift of God, miracle plant, a planet savior, and versatile material, and so more, and many more. And I'm standing here uh, beside is the world, world biggest bamboo. This is Dendrocarimus gigantius in the, at the border of Thailand and, uh, and Myanmar, that side. And this is the king of South Asian bamboo, Dendrocarimus asper. And this is Mosul bamboo, the temperate weather bamboo, China. And yeah, what is important here is that bamboo releases 35% more oxygen than equivalent of trees. Yeah? And bamboo can be continued harvest. Yeah, you, you don't have to replant it. Yeah? Okay, uh, interesting slide here because uh, how human uh, develop their, I mean, they are crossing the river skills using bamboo with the beginning of swimming, then uh, floating on uh, just a piece of bamboo here. And still, they still have this uh, skill in China. And after that, then they, they revolve into evolve into raft. And this is in Kampung Cham, Cambodia. I was here before. Uh, so, so you see how they develop to, uh, using bamboo to cross the river. And this is in southwest of Bangkok. Uh, basically a raft, a bridge. Yeah. So it's combined. So very good, very good solution how to cross the river as the uh, water level rises, the bridge or so, the raft will rise and it goes like that. So it can be used throughout the year. Okay, my patient earlier was mentioned by Eugene that about bamboo bike. Yeah, bamboo bike, when I ride my bamboo bike around, people say it's something new, something new. No, it's not something new. It's more than like uh, 120 years already. Yeah? And they started making bamboo bikes in England those days. Yeah, So, so that's why I say that it's, it's not something new. It's very long, 120 years. And, and this is bikes at our bamboo center. And normally when we try to sell the bike, the question is how strong, how long can it last, you know, that kind of things. Huh? And finally, how much it costs? <laughs> okay, it's very strong here. You can see here that, that three, three big guys are riding this bike. It's a small bamboo, you can see that, but still, yeah. So this, the, how strong. I used to say that it can last very long unless you take a saw or a parang to, to cut it, you know. So mine was already like five years, my personal bamboo bike. I'm still riding it. And this is, uh, again, how strong and how long can last. This is 1,000 years ago. This bridge in Anlan, China, yeah, uh, was from bamboo. The cable was from bamboo fiber. Yeah, bamboo fiber, yeah, yeah. But since 1970 something, they changed now to steel, steel to steel uh, cable already because of maintenance. But, but however, whatever, it lasts. 1,000 years, this. So this is one of the engineering marvels of the ancient world. It's recognized as one of the top five bridges in China. Okay, and nowadays you can see that this kind of bridge, you know, a modern, contemporary, yeah, present days. And this is, uh, Eugene was involved with this in Bali earlier, uh, Sharma Spring, and costing $2 million, more than 8 million ringgit, this villa, six-story villa, okay. And I just want to make this comparison here. You see that how versatile this material is from this hut, which costs around just 3,000 ringgit. Uh, uh, nearby my, my bamboo center here, by the Orang Asli, costs 3,000 ringgit, you know, about $20 per square foot. Huh? And from very low, very cheap to very expensive. This is high end villas. It costs like 1,300 per square foot. Huh? So that means uh, anything between here works with bamboo. Huh? So, so that is. I was saying that a very versatile uh, building material here. Okay, and here just a little bit of, this is our tropical bamboo, the sympodial clumping bamboo. Uh, and this is the temperate weather bamboo, the monopodial or running bamboo. Yeah? So we have tropical bamboo or room point, yeah? room point. And bamboo is giant grass, it's not a tree. Yeah? So grass like in your compound, every month you have to cut your grass. Yeah? So that goes with bamboo also. If you, you cut the bamboo, it's still growing yeah? for maybe three or four generation can last. You plant once, it can last you for three or four generations. Okay. And this is a little bit about the cross section of bamboo, how it looks like if we uh, under the uh, microscopy yeah, lens. So we can see the there are basically here, you can see that what is important here is the density. Density is only 500 to 800 kg per meter cube and contain the 50% parenchyma fiber and also vessel. So we have vessel all the way along, along the channel on the bamboo. And another thing here is hemicellulose. This is the, the issue <laughs> regarding durability of bamboo huh? because this hemicellulose is, is the food, it's a starch food for many insects eh? and also for fungus and fungi. Okay. And uh, yeah, these are other things about bamboo because uh, 
of the cellulose content, hollow, you know, and also hygroscopic. You know, so it's very low natural durability. Yeah? Here is the bamboo, the first and only one bamboo clock tower in the world. Basically, it's a study project here uh, by us that you want to see how the bamboo reacts towards direct ex exposure to rain and shine here. It, this is in Pengkalan Bulu, Pengkalan Hulu, eh? Terra, uh, north state of, of Malaysia. And, and we have got fungal attack here, insect attack. Huh? Because why? Bamboo itself does not have any toxic constituent huh? that can defend himself. So, so that's why we, we have to preserve it or, or we have to treat it. And, and this is my bamboo center in Terra. That time was, that year was, uh, 2015, 2015, I was really, I mean, I started bamboo 2013, then 2015, I wanted all my outlook there to be in bamboo. So we have training sessions, so we build, using the training yeah, to build this house, to build this fence, to build this, uh, this tower here using the training. And, and just recently, about a month back, all those are gone. Yeah? Why? Because uh, if I continue having this fence, then it looks bad on bamboo. Yeah? because of the, the, I see that low durability. Yeah? So we remove the tower, we remove the, the fence, you know? Yeah. So, and earlier we planted many bamboos, you can see the bamboo, you cannot even see the house now, so uh, the bamboo. So that's, that's to show you that over a period of six years, six years, um, yeah, things, uh, I, mean, I mean, change a lot, huh? rot, rot turning, huh? so uh, broken cracks, you know? and also, yeah, weathered by, and this is in, Ilo Ilo, uh, Maasin in Philippines. And that is one resort. All the buildings are in bamboo. And probably when they start off, this building was really good. You know? well, so now uh, this is how it looks. Huh? And here are defined many uh, basics uh, uh, design required to, to, to protect the building. So as you can see, yeah, very, very short uh, overhang and all that. So this is how the buildings look nowadays. Maybe I think this building is more like maybe 12 years or 15 years. And this is another building there at this, at this Bimbo Resort, see, all rotting and all that. So these are the issues that we have to address no? in order for us to promote more usage of bamboo in construction. So, so these are the bad images, actually. Maybe here it's lack of maintenance, yeah, no, no uh, revanishing of the surface and all that. So here, so in a very nice like a motive huh? using the bamboo strips. Huh? But see what happened? So, so these are the things that, I mean, Sometimes people begin to question whether they want to embark on bamboo buildings or not <laughs> because of images like this. So we have to solve this. Yeah? And this is my last three years project in Langkawi, the Datai, the prestigious premier resort in, 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 in Langkawi. So you see that? All the, because here the humidity is very high. So all the trusses rots, yeah? rots and all that, and attacks by post, post powder beetles, uh, fungi and all that. So, so this again, so, but this, this is already like 20 years. Huh? So after 20 years, this is how it looks. I don't know earlier whether they use treated bamboo poles or they, they treat using chemical or they treat using traditional ways. I don't know. So no, no, no record on that. But however, this is already like 20 years and this is how it looks. So, so we, 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 we take a six months contract to, to rebuild back all the bamboo here. And, and these are also typical, uh, yeah, you can see, you know, like termites attack. Huh? Beside the post powder beetle, we have termites also effects on the bamboo. Okay. And this is a nice uh, chair using the uh, Gigantophora atrovesia or the black bamboo. So we, we import the black bamboo from Indonesia. Then we make at our center. Then the, 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 the exporter was saying that they treated the bamboo. Yeah? Maybe they treated it traditional way. And after a while, you can see the powder. Eh? The powder on the floor is a post powder beetle. Uh, yeah? attack the, so maybe not a chemical uh, treatment, maybe they just doing traditional treatment. And here, so you can see that. So nice chair, but spoiled because of this attack by beetle. And uh, so we need to preserve the bamboo. Eh? So without, without preservation, normally less than two years gone. Eh? I built a balai sewang by orang asli, last me four years then gone, everything eaten and everything rot. Eh? So because not treated. But if we treat it, maybe more, more, more 40 years or, or 50 years or more or life, huh? or life or what. So, so this is important of bamboo preservation. And these are the kinds of problems that we have. Huh? These are the major problems that we have with bamboo in terms of durability, the, the mold, the, the fungi, uh, the soft rot, and also 
termite, post powder beetles. Eh? So, and so these are the, the things that, that, that affect the, the, I mean, the durability and also the, the life of the, our bamboo building or structure. Okay, this is again, uh, this one probably will be covered more by uh, Eugene saying that whatever bamboo design must have a big head and big boots. And eh? so that is protection against rain and shine. Eh? So like this area is, I mean, the rainwater can reach here, so it will like rot and also uh, also the, so the sunlight, the ultraviolet will make the bamboo cracks and this part probably need maintenance here, where the rest is sheltered properly. Okay. And this one thing, important thing also before we treat bamboo is that you have to select the matured, uh, really good bamboo. Eh? Yeah, the, normally for in the species of asper, betong or uh, mantan here, Scotia we take three years to six years like that. Eh? That, that, that age that we take, no, no, no younger and no older eh, for our structural purpose. Okay. And there's also your technique of harvesting also must be good, eh? properly sustainable so that you ensure that although you take out the bamboo, but the, 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 the clam still growing well, eh? new shoot sticks are still coming out. So this is very important. Also the timing when the starch level is low or high. Eh? So you have to plan your, your felling or harvesting of your uh, bamboo poles. And this, after that, you transport your bamboo, yeah, depend on whatever your terrain and also your available, uh, yeah, your available uh, there, what is available there. And here they are transporting by river. And transporting by river, so it's a kind of treatment here because the, the, the bamboo, are, yeah, some are submerged under the water. So there is a kind of natural, traditional treatment. And we have got method of treatment, traditional chemical treatment. So these are all the treatment. I will just go through a few uh, major ones that we used to practice here. Yeah? Okay. And this is the uh, orang kampung selalu buat lah, the villagers, the leech, yeah? leaching in the river, pond, or, or tanks, or whatever. So leaching, and or even salt water, so you can leach it, but you need a period of two months. And this is basically not commercially viable, yeah? because for, for, for commercial purpose, we need thousands, thousands of pieces of bamboo. So this is just for small scale, and also for, yeah. And it takes very long to, to treat this way. Yeah? And you cannot have be certified how the, the effective of it. Yeah? So you cannot certify it. So that's why you have to go for chemical treatment. So this is a process before we chemical treat the bamboo. We have to perforate it, make the holes, you have to clean it. And this is a process, punching holes and all that. Okay. And this, this is a quite popular preservative that we use. It's a, basically the most safe uh, preservative is boron. Boron is a mixture of boric acid and borax in the ratio of 1 and 1.5. Yeah? You can see here. Yeah? And it's, it's, and it's, it's non-toxic, so you can, you can hold it. Yeah? So, and you have to use heat to, 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 salt, to, to dilute it yeah? into the water. 6% right? or 10% depend on the species of bamboo. So after that, you can use vertical soap, horizontal soap, uh, or sherry, or hot dipping yeah? using the chemical that you prepare. And this is the horizontal soap. Huh? Horizontal soap. Uh, I will just quickly one video here. This is our temporary, we, we say that we use canvas tank. We, we bring the tank. Here we've got six here at this place, the tanks of this size that we can like 100 poles per, per tank that we treat in. So this is what we call horizontal soap. And we use the same bag here, it's a counterweight too, so that the bamboo is sunken beneath the, the water. Okay. And after that, we, after a period of two weeks, we take it out, we drip it out, and we start drying it. Okay. And this is, uh, the one just now earlier was using boron. And uh, now is uh, the palupo eh, for the roofing material. So here, the palupo for the roofing of our project in the Eco Bentong. And, and here we are, uh, we are using not boron, we are using CCB, eh, copper chrome boron. Copper chrome boron is a fixed uh, preservative. It don't leach out if stuck with water. So this is because it's, it's exposed to rain and shine. So we use copper chrome boron here for the treatment. So we place the palupo or the flattened bamboo inside here. Uh, this one for the roof. Okay, that is horizontal soap. This is vertical soap. Vertical soap here, we follow the manual developed by Environmental Bamboo Foundation, Linda Garland. The late Linda Garland was a pioneer at this kind of manual. And we build our own tower in our center. And so we build a tower, we stand up. Uh, so we fill, we fill up the, the bamboo, every bamboo with the preservative. Yeah? You punch the hole from top, 
uh, from top to bottom, but you don't uh, the last uh, the last the last diaphragm uh, or the node, so you don't punch it. So that what you can contain water, and you let the water the, the preservative there for two weeks, uh, and after that. And here is uh, another uh, simplified way. If you don't have a tower, you can use a tree like here they are using in Africa. And these are so my boys at our project site. They're using a short length. So you just make it like the staging to do the vertical soap decision. And this is a bouchery, bouchery method. This, uh, this is my favorite method here because it's, uh, you don't waste. Uh, only thing that you have to have some uh, equipment to start with. And uh, yeah, and you don't have much. Uh, uh, and, and you just use a little bit of preservative for every pole. I just find it like this. Way. So this, yeah, this is our uh, Bauchery uh, treatment center in Dusun Eco. You can treat like 15 poles per cycle. And this is a nozzle, pressurized nozzle. And this is the, uh, the, the preservative tank. We pressure the preservative tank to, to a pressure of two bar. So then you will push the uh, preservative to the, uh, this is the air compressor to pressure the, the, uh, sort of the preservative tank. And yeah, then we have nozzle. Nozzle will push the, the preservative into the bamboo. And uh, it will go to the far end here, and slightly lower, and we collect it back. We collect it back, uh, the whatever. And it will drip here. This is the far end. So after a period, depending on the species of bamboo and the length of bamboo. Uh, so the, at first, we have clear water. That is the bamboo water. You can see here that the dripping bamboo water. But after like 45 minutes or uh, 15 minutes, the red color water, we put a dye just now in the preservative, will start coming here. And we allow another like 15, 20 minutes until the whole surface here turn to the color of the preservative. Then we know that the, the whole of this vessel here, all the way here being filled up by our preservative. So, so this is Bauchery, and this is how we collect it. Yeah? And these are all the nozzles, and this is the, the preservative tank. And this hot dipping, hot dipping is boiling. We also have this one also, small tank that we boil. This one, we use a lot of, I mean, and, uh, I mean, you have to have uh, firewoods and all that. So a lot, lot of energy and all that. So we don't really, unless, unless we need it to be very fast, eh, to treat it very fast, then we boil it for two hours normally. And, and this is another method that you can DIY at home. You just put a, maybe a box here and you fill up with your preservative and you cut the bamboo and stand it up and let the bamboo self uh, sucking the uh, sucking the, uh, the preservative into the bamboo poles and let it, and you top up your preservative here until the whole uh, bamboo comes dry off. Huh? So this is what we call post-transpiration. And this can DIY for small scale, you can do this huh, if you wanted to, your bamboo. And, and right now we don't know because we are, not, I'm, I'm doing a research on to find to treat bamboo using uh, herbs. Huh? And this one, my research I'm doing, I'm using the noni fruit, huh? or they call it in, uh, uh, in Malay, it's mengkudu, the down and buah, the fruit and the leaf. So I, I, I extract it and I'm trying to use this one as preservative. So far at the, I mean, at this stage it works well. So if this is good, that is, it is effective, then perhaps I can early, I mean, use this, this uh, uh, plant extract for commercial, eh? commercial preserv preservation and can be used by villagers where they have a lot of this pokok mengkudu, eh? pokok mengkudu or this morinda pitifolia. So it's re readily available this one. So this I'm working on it. I hope that in the next one year or two years I finish this research, then we can start using this extract for commercial. And, and that's all about my present. And it's just a bit of <laughs> commercial here. My bamboo jungle adventures. <laughs> okay, it's, nice. it's okay. So we are selling treated poles also. We are selling seedling. We have got guest house in Sungai Siput. Huh? And also we conduct trainings. Huh? Training from planting bamboo, nursery, uh, bamboo working, construction, making furniture, the whole spectrum of, yeah. Uh, but we are not a big company, but we do everything here. And we have international also uh, oh. seminar workshop here. And this is part we didn't grow from Bali. This is one of our prominent. <laughs> Our associates are coming to, to conduct training with us. And also, we have volunteer programs. So, if you, see, if you guys are interested to volunteer at our, our village, is just beside the forest, the jungle. So, we have Aboriginal village there, and you can volunteer. So, we have all volunteers from all over the world coming to our place to do volunteering work, especially with the Aborigines. 
Okay, so these are, we have got nice babies. This is my house, my personal house at Aboriginal Village, built by them. I give them some small money <laughs> to buy food and they build a house for me here at the village. Yeah. Uh, and last from me is our Mission Bemo Society. I always come with you all guys to join us at our society so that we can share, we can learn, you know, and we can socialize also. Uh, so join us at Mission Bemo Society. I think I'm okay, usually with my timing. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Yeah. I was really worried that I will short the time. I hope that, that will no, give no. you just Very an, good. an Very idea. Good. Yeah, just an idea how we durable clean also treat more bamboo. If you wanted to know more, then you have to come and meet us like me, Eugene, or and the rest. <laughs> then we can let you more. We talk one whole day about treatment. <laughs> okay, that's all for me. Thank you. Thank you, Ahmad Maslan. Thank you for your talk. I'm sure we'll hear from you later when there are more questions and, and you can help to answer them. Thank you very much. Um, the next speaker is, strangely enough, me. So I'm going to introduce myself. Bear with me. I will talk about design essentials for bamboo buildings. Um, first, the intro. Uh, I'm an architect and I practice in England and Malaysia and Australia for more than 30 years. Over the last seven years, I refocused and committed my work towards bamboo design, building, and teaching. Right? Um, I joined Ibuku in 2015 as lead architect and worked with the Ibuku team to create many of the bamboo buildings in Green School, Green Village, and in Ibuku's projects internationally. I've been promoting bamboo via talks and workshops uh, since 2016 in Bamboo U, Bali, and over the last three years, uh, further advocating bamboo and architecture, design, teaching, and mentoring within organizations in universities in Southeast Asia. In 2018, I started my own bamboo journey, further widening the experience and network in bamboo by delivering projects through 1010 Design, uh, my architecture practice that operates in Australia and the Asia Pacific region. At the start of 2020, my wife and I returned to Bali, returned to Melbourne from Bali. And during the pandemic lockdowns, I started Better Bamboo Buildings. Better Bamboo Buildings is a bamboo platform sharing design information and insights that is developed into a bamboo building design course and learning resource. I currently work on bamboo building projects in Southeast Asia and am writing a book on bamboo architecture to be published early next year. Um, with that, I'm going to share my screen and start the talk. So what I'm going to share with you within the 15 minutes that I've been allocated is starting off with four examples of bamboo buildings that are sustainable and affordable. I start off with this humble bamboo building, a parking block in Chiang Mai. This has been done by Chris Sola. Chris, Chris attended Bamboo U um, and I was helping to run Bamboo U as well, I think about three, four years ago. And he then went off from Bamboo U to Chiang Mai to start his own building. He has built three or four buildings since then. Look him up under solar architecture. Um, he built this example, which is, I find this um, a humble but well-designed building in the sense that it lifts the bamboo off the ground, protects the bamboo, right? It has many overhangs, generous overhangs that also helps the bamboo. Bamboo rots and bamboo gets eaten by pests, as we know from Ahmad Maslan. So we need to treat bamboo well and protect it. This next project is interesting. It is based in Assam in India. And there are about 80 or so bamboo buildings like that now. Um, done by Seeds, a social enterprise and architectural um, organization. 
this project uses bamboo locally, right? Bamboo is sourced locally, built by local artisans and involves community design, community um, sweat labor, so that it is suitable and apt for where it is. It is a disaster resilient building that really works in the sense that if you look at it, the bamboo is on stilts. And during the non-flood season, it is used well for animals, for children to play, as you can see. But when the floods hit Assam, which they do once or twice a year, the bamboo gets submerged. This bamboo is treated with almost like a rubberized solution throughout the year, as you can see here. It's all got black tar kind of solution that protects the bamboo when it's submerged for a few weeks at least sometimes. Um, there is also a mechanism in the house that lifts the platform up before the floods and then drops it back again after the floods. A very interesting way indeed. With base Bahai housing, you will hear more from Luis Lopez later on. Um, it is an excellent example of affordable social housing that uses bamboo as its main framing method combined with cement. Um, I will not go too much into detail with this, but for people that are interested in affordable and social housing, please note this scheme and look into it at more detail. The last example I'm putting forward is from Asali Bali. Olivia, if you are listening in here, yeah, Olivia uh, does a lot of design engineering, bamboo design engineering and construction work uh, out of Bali and now going international as well. Um, but this simple project by him uh, about two years ago is something I wanted to highlight. Um, it uses some materials, other materials that connects uh, the bamboo together. This again, uh, Dr. Andre will talk about in his talk later. Um, but what I wanted to show here is the use of bamboo um, in a very simple yet structurally efficient way, um, sitting it on top of containers, combining it with containers, right? Raising it off the ground so that it doesn't get wet, giving good overhangs so that the rain and the sun doesn't hit the bamboo, but protects the bamboo well. And a special feature of this is prefabrication. A lot of the work that Asali Bali did for this one is off-site or prefabricated on ground, on site, and put up very, very quickly. So something to bear in mind. I'll continue now with talking about design essentials for bamboo. Um, what, what is needed? What is needed when one has to design a bamboo building, right? What are the essentials? The first thing we really need to look at is to use suitable bamboo. By that, I mean making sure your bamboo is harvested properly, ethically and responsibly, right? Making sure that is then transported well without scratching the bamboo through and then treated in the best possible way and seasoned in the best possible way. When people talk about structural bamboo, it doesn't mean that all bamboo is good structural bamboo, right? The bamboo is to be right. The bamboo is to be treated well so that you can use it in the right way and the structure can then stand up to what it's designed for. Another factor or design essential is to apply preventive design. Preventive in the sense that we want to prevent bamboo from getting eaten by pests, so we treat it well, right? With chemicals, sometimes with organic ways as well, but also preventive in a way that um, we design out the chance of bamboo being affected by rain, right? By damp, by mold and fungus, right? This is very important, guys. Those of you who are wanting to design in bamboo, lift the bamboo off the ground, give it some shoes, give it a foot, Lift it off by plinths, apply generous roof overhangs so that the sun and the rain doesn't hit the bamboo, especially at the base, right? 
these are some of the basics for bamboo design. Of course, part of it is also to allow buildings in the tropics to be able to be well ventilated, use um, tropical passive design elements that uh, help to create cross ventilation so that mold doesn't form and the buildings that we, we, we go in are comfortable, right? That is important. This other essential that I want to put forward is to reset and align with bamboo. When you want to work with bamboo and design in bamboo, reset yourself. Um, do not think conventionally, but think more about bamboo um, as something organic. Let the bamboo talk to you and not box bamboo in, right? Don't let bamboo pretend to be steel or timber, okay? Because bamboo has got its own organic property. There is no 100% straight bamboo pole, right? Bamboo pole tapers, twists in various directions. So we need to work in a way that allows for the bamboo then um, to put its properties forward. So work with bamboo and not against it. There are a lot of questions usually about this on bamboo and compliance, right? It is, in many countries, bamboo is still not yet compliant. You'll hear a lot more from Louise about bamboo standards, but where in countries where there are no bamboo standards, we have to be really smart about socializing it with the people that are gonna approve it, right? Almost have to introduce it to them, take them on tours, show them precedence of what bamboo can do. And you will see some precedents coming up again from the buildings I've shown and also from the other speakers. Um, bamboo is growing fast and how we have to introduce it correctly so that bamboo doesn't fail, right? By that, I mean, take into consideration the structural form, the seismic loadings, the wind loadings before we start designing, right? Make sure you talk to the approving authorities, the engineers, the council officers, so that they are then socialized into it rather than them saying, oh, I've never approved a bamboo building. How can I do it? You know, it's, it's impossible. It is possible. Only how we can then socialize and work with them through it, through specialists and experts that have already paved the way through. The other thing really closing in is to innovate, right? Bamboo is re-emerging. It is so exciting in the bamboo world for many countries. Um, one of the fields I want to highlight here among the few things that I've mentioned is prefabrication. I think prefabrication, when we work with full calm bamboo, meaning bamboo poles that are, are natural and full without being engineered, prefabrication is a big step towards making our bamboo buildings more efficient, uh, more quickly erected, and probably even more quality controlled, right? If we can prefabricate offsite, bring it in, I think that will really help us. Um, we will discuss more about bamboo and fire and protective coatings later on. So part of this design essentials is, is really extracted from the course that I do. So for those who want to learn more about it, have a look at us at Better Bamboo Buildings, right? WWW Better Bamboo Buildings. Okay, I'm gonna stop sharing. Our next speaker, is going to be Andri, Andri, Dr. Andri. And Andri is going to talk about bamboo affordable housing and bamboo joints. Dr. Andri is an architect, a lecturer, and a researcher in the School of Architecture, Planning, and Policy Development in Institute Technology, Bandung, Indonesia. He started working with bamboo in 1999 and developed plastered bamboo construction. 
for low cost housing. After studying bamboo architecture in Colombia, he changed his approach of promoting bamboo by designing high end buildings to increase its value. One of his achievements in design was award winning Great Hall OBI. He gained his doctoral degree from the Chair of Structures and Structural Design Faculty of Architecture, Aachen, Germany in 2012 with his dissertation, Traditional Innovative Joints in Bamboo Construction, resulting lashing base bamboo connections with high strength, high tensile strength. It is actually, personally, I've, I've gone through this dissertation and it's really great. It's got a lot of useful um, information from bamboo. Andre is now focusing on advanced application of bamboo, such as tensegrity structures, reciprocal frames, tensile structures, as well as space structures with new design approach in parametric design. In promoting new ways of construction bamboo, he has conducted many lectures, um, including the one I've seen, which is with the AA school, and hands-on workshops all over the world. So let me hand you over to Dr. Andre. Andre, please go ahead. Yes, thank you very much. Let me share my screen, yeah. Yeah, thank you very much for the organizer committee to have me here to talk about uh, affordable housing and bamboo joint. Um, yeah, I would like to start my presentation with, uh, uh, <clears throat> with this bamboo construction classification because it is very important to, to have this kind of uh, uh, overview about what would be the, the, con the bamboo construction. If you see here, uh, all of this structure here was part of the uh, bamboo construction. Mm, the easiest way, of course, to, to uh, classify it based on the, on the form of the bamboo. Like this is the bamboo pole construction. Bamboo can be also used as a split construction. It can be also a com com uh, combination between uh, the concrete and bamboo, and it can be also like in the form of laminated. But as if you see the upper part here, you will see that uh, the upper part like this is the best example that bamboo trying to replace uh, the steel in a steel reinforced concrete to become a bamboo reinforced concrete. And this is uh, the, the ideal also how bamboo can be 100% replace the timber. That's why the top part, I would like to uh, classify this one as a substitutive bamboo construction because the idea of the bamboo construction is just trying to replace other material with bamboo. And uh, other than the substitutives, uh, I would like to call it as non-substitutive or conventional, in which I would like to separate it into engineered bamboo construction and also traditional bamboo construction. This uh, plastered bamboo construction can be part of uh, conventional, but it can be also as part of the uh, substitutive bamboo construction because the idea can be also, this can be changed. Uh, this was made to change the brick construction. Instead of using brick, we can change it into this uh, plastered bamboo construction. And today I would like, uh, oh yeah, this is, this is the whole project that I've done so far. A range from the geodesic dome, uh, as bamboo space frame, tensegrity, and also a reciprocal frame, and in the in the form of the uh, engineered bamboo construction. Uh, this is the OBI, and this is the the recent uh, open bamboo mosque in in uh, Lombok. Uh, but today, I would like only to talk about these uh, two specific uh, projects which is uh, the development of uh, plastered bamboo construction and also how this uh, development of ba bamboo also trying to um, uh, affect it, the design of the plastered bamboo construction. And <clears throat> I would like to start with showing this uh, very uh, nice detail of the traditional bamboo uh, joint uh, bamboo was meant to be used for uh, rapid construction because it's, it is, can be very easily uh, connected one to the other using uh, the wire. 
and also this uh, uh, dowel, bamboo dowel. And it can be done easily by using the simple tool like, like machete. That's why after uh, earthquake, I would like to use also uh, all of the uh, lesson learned from the traditional to build the proposed family scale review G tens using as simple uh, join as possible. And this is gonna be the, the design of the scale. It's, it's just a very simple uh, A-frame scale uh, to build the 10. And then we can, we, with the student, I uh, uh, make the workshop um, prior to going to the, to the real field. And after that, we built um, many uh, family shelter for uh, the refugee in Lombok. Also in Mamuju, the recently uh, earthquake in uh, Sulawesi, and uh, yeah, uh, and many other places. Yeah, also in Palu. Mm. <clears throat> but now I would like to show you that bamboo is very much easy to be split. Yeah, splitting is is uh, is one of the characteristic of the bamboo because bamboo has a longitudinal fiber and it's causing the easy of splitting. Even when it grows, uh, some bamboo can, uh, can start uh, splitting like this. That's why I would try to uh, using this uh, development of uh, the splitting and also the, the, the simplest join as possible to develop the plastered bamboo construction. Why? Because almost no one in Indonesia, especially I think also in all over the the world don't want to live in the bamboo house anymore like this. But when I found the uh, construction that was built uh, by the Dutch during the colonial era in the early 19th century, I saw that this building is uh, have been stand there for almost uh, uh, a century. And it looks like a, a brick construction. Although inside we can see that uh, this consists of the plaster, uh, consists of bamboo. That's why from this part, I would like to, uh, I make a, a new concept of plastic bamboo construction by using as much bamboo as possible and hiding and use the low, the lowest quality of bamboo, especially in Indonesia, we have Giganto Hua Apus or bamboo tali, which is very uh, cheap. And then it can be also an alternative to preserve the bamboo against uh, rain, against direction, and also the preventing from the entering of the fungi and the beetles. And I use, I try to use as simple technology as possible. And the idea is also trying to provide the quick response shelter in the emergency cases, providing the common image of permanent house because uh, everybody wants to live like in, in this kind of, uh, let's say concrete house. And it's also trying to improve the fire resistance of the, of the bamboo house. And then this is the detail of the structure, which is very, very simple, basically, uh, using bamboo as a, as a skeleton and, and use the last thing based joinery. Uh, it's just as simple as a traditional joinery and using also this tying wire as a stirrup uh, in which that uh, after we built this uh, module, we can plaster it and we, it, it's look, it looks like a wall or sorry, a brick construction or masonry construction. The idea is trying to replace the conventional method. Yeah, uh, this is uh, the very common uh, approach in Indonesia. They build the emergency shelter, and then after a while, it can be replaced and become the waste. And with this uh, plastic bamboo construction, uh, we prefabricated the bamboo panels, and then we can use these bamboo panels as an emergency shelter. Uh, and then we can also build uh, the semi-permanent bamboo houses and gradually they can plaster the bamboo to have a permanent uh, structure. And yeah, this is the module that the prefabricated model that we've been built. And then after we plaster it, we, we, we have uh, the similar like uh, brick construction. And this is the first prototype in 1999. Uh, <clears throat> this is as the first prototype for low cost housing uh, using bamboo mat. We can build this one only one day and then gradually the plastering process take uh, quite time to have this uh, kind of permanent structure. So this is the, the first prototype of the building and we, we built this or we assembled all of the 
the frame here uh, in the workshop and then transported all of the frame to the location. And then we built or erected uh, this frame uh, in only one day to provide these uh, bamboo uh, houses. And then gradually we plastered the bamboo and then, we, and then in the end we have this uh, uh, bamboo, plastered bamboo construction that it's quite similar with uh, masonry construction. And there are some projects that have been done uh, by this kind of uh, technique uh, in, in Sukabumi, in Chilachap, in, uh, this is the recently built uh, in our, with our university fund uh, in 2020. And then uh, I've done also uh, the uh, fire test. We've done also the, another fire test uh, uh, with uh, Luis, this bit Baha'i, but uh, this is a, a different kind of type. Yeah, the previous one maybe will be presented by by Luis. But uh, in here, we, we use the uh, the similar with the system that I've done, and we already passed uh, passing two hours of fire test. Uh, the research was uh, led by uh, my colleague Ibu Lili Tambunan. And what about the development of the traditional from this lasting bamboo joint? The development uh, was done by using the bolted joint. With this bolted joint, we can we can uh, have a much better uh, connection. Yeah, we can we can even use um, we can even connect many bamboo uh, as a structural system, as one structural system, using this bolted joint, in which that we cannot do it in traditional way of construction. The development is just by uh, switching from this lasting and the wall to this bolted joint. And then uh, because of that, I, I, uh, and I also learned about the, the development of uh, bamboo, plastic bamboo in this Baha'i that will be presented by uh, Luis Lopez. And then I make this uh, kind of system in which uh, I combine uh, bamboo and also ferro cement uh, that I've called it as Rubaf, Rumah Bamboo Ferro Cement. And we built this one uh, recently. And basically we use this full joint to connect the uh, horizontal and also the vertical bamboo together and put the chicken wire in between these two. Yeah, so it's, it's much, it, it is very easy to do and it's also very quick. And then after that, we can have this uh, module and then uh, after all of the module have been uh, assembled in the workshop and then we build on site. Yeah, we can build this one also a very quick way. And then as you see here, uh, we are using also the very, there is no, if you see here, there is no um, uh, a door. Yeah, later we, we just cut this one. So it's, it's much easier to do uh, using this kind of uh, type. And then it can be built. And then uh, after that, gradually, we can plaster the chicken wire yeah, to have this uh, uh, rubaf, ferrocement, bamboo ferrocement uh, houses. And we provide this one for this old lady that have been affected by the earthquake in, in Malang. And this is the final result of the structure. Uh, and then what about the development of bamboo housing technology in, in, in my experience, yeah? Starting from this plastic bamboo construction using as simple as lacing, using uh, steel wire. Uh, but then I developed it into full column bamboo plus ferro cement using this bolted joint. And in, in, in my house, I would like to show you uh, later, I combining uh, this uh, full column bamboo plus ferro cement with a barcom joint, yeah, in which this is the, the, the uh, very high tensile strength of joint that have been uh, invented during my uh, dissertation in Germany. And in my opinion, uh, this can be used uh, later as um, maybe like uh, earthquake and also typhoon resistant uh, housing in the future. I already have the, 
the design of this, but um, maybe it's not, it is too premature to present it in this, in this uh, uh, lecture. Uh, what is BACOM joint? BACOM was a bamboo radial compression joint. The idea is very simple. The tension here was converted yeah, in such a way that the, the tension was converted into radial compression perpendicular to the fiber. The higher the tension, the, the bigger radial compression and will generate a lot of friction on the outside. And as you mentioned by uh, uh, Ahmad Mazlan, the outer part is the strongest part of the bamboo. Yeah, so because a lot of, uh, a lot of uh, fiber and also consists a lot of uh, silica content. And then this is the development of this uh, barcom joint. And then it has been used uh, in the reconstruction of three mountain building in Bali. And then I use it also in my house project because I would like also to have a kind of uh, strength against the, the strong wind. Although it is not really um, meant to, to have that. Uh, basically, this is also, try, I'm trying also to have a kind of footing in each of bamboo that I've used to prevent from uh, humidity from the ground. And this is the way I've done it. And uh, so this is sit on, on, the, on the concrete beam and I've connected all of this barcom joint to this uh, concrete to have a certain uh, strength in, in uh, tension, in tension. So this is uh, uh, basically when I, when I uh, renovate my houses, the, the previous structure was still there. And then suddenly the bamboo growing up from the, from the existing roof. And I connected also with the same kind of technique using this barcom join, using this P join, barcom join also here. And also, uh, I don't want to use all of this because it's quite uh, expensive to have this kind of system, yeah, but it's, it's much stronger than this one. That's why I'm trying to also to use the, the other way of barcom join. Uh, this, is, uh, this is two ways of barcom join that I've used in my house. And then, yeah, this is the, the, uh, the main roof structure and the main roof structure of my house uh, using barcom joint on top of the structure and also the bottom part of the structure. So yeah, this is the detail of this barcom joint and I also use it on, on the front, uh, on the front uh, facade oh. and using this one. And then, yeah, this is the final result of this uh, barcom joint. So in, in this house, I also using a lot of uh, uh, combination between the uh, plaster and also combining with bamboo. Some of the uh, concrete wall here was the uh, existing, existing brick wall. And then I try to use uh, some of them and, and I replace it some of them with, with uh, bamboo. Uh, like in this case, I use uh, bamboo, uh, plaster bamboo. In the outer part, you, you will see the bamboo, but in the inner part, uh, it, will, it was plastered by a mortar. Uh, as you see here, this is also a plastered bamboo construction. In the outer part, you see the, the uh, bamboo uh, uh, woven, woven flattened bamboo, yeah, or in, in Spanish you call it you call it as esterilla, or in Indonesia we call it as palupo, and I weave this one uh, to become the uh, the the wall. So this is going to be the 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 guest house, sorry the guest room. So. Uh, in the inside, I plastered uh, with with mortar. Uh, I use also my kind of joinery in here uh, because I don't want to make the the what do you call it the T join here because when we we built the T join using the the threaded rod, you will see uh, nuts in 
in the in the railing on top of the railing. So this bamboo will be hold down by this wire, and this wire was uh, connected in the bottom part by a mechanism of this uh, uh, barcom joint in the bottom part. Yeah, in here. So basically, the the wire was holding 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 down this uh, this railing. Yeah, holding down this railing. So that's why I don't want to have a, a, a nuts on the top, on top of this uh, on this uh, T joint here. So and this is connected to this here. And uh, I make a free stressing by by using the mechanism of this uh, voltage join in the bottom part. So I use also bamboo as a, a wall uh, on top of this existing uh, brick wall. And this is uh, the, the, the facade in the front facade. Uh, as you see here, I use also uh, woven bamboo combining with uh, strand woven bamboo. Uh, this is not timber, but this is still bamboo, but using a different kind of material, which is strand woven bamboo. And yeah, this is in the interior part. I try to uh, I try to expose all the bamboo that I've used, uh, like in the rafter here. Uh, I combining with uh, timber as uh, an opening, yeah, as a wall. I use also bamboo here for the for the uh, uh, stairs, yeah. Yeah, thank you very much for your attention. Uh, I give it back to you, uh, Eugene. Thank you. Thank you, Pa Andre. Thank you for your, your interesting presentation. Uh, we'll come back to you later on in the Q&A. Uh, we'll now move on to Luis Lopez. Uh, Luis is going to talk to us about bamboo standards and social housing. Luis Felipe Lopez is a civil engineer from Colombian National University and also has an MSc in Civil Engineering from Los Andes University, Bogota, Colombia. He is currently working as Head of Technology as Base Baha'i Foundation, including a Philippine, which is a Philippines-based organization supported by the Hilti Foundation. BBF uses cement bamboo frame technology to build social low cost houses. And until 2021, the foundation has built more than 1000 house units around the Philippines and also 50 in Nepal. Luis is one of the authors of the Colombian Bamboo Structural Design Code, NSR10. And he has collaborated actively in the development of the Peruvian and Ecuadorian bamboo codes as well. Currently, he is part of the ISO committee, TC165, Timber and Bamboo Structures, representing Colombia, where he works keenly in the update of the ISO 22156 Bamboo Structural Design Standard, uh, which has already been published in June 2021. Luis used to work as a researcher at the University of Andes in Bogota, Colombia, where he participated in many research projects about bamboo structures, earthquake resistance. He also was a consultant to the Ministry of Culture of Colombia on issues concerning structural rehab of heritage buildings. Another side point is that Luis has also worked with one of the bamboo masters, one of the early bamboo masters, um, as well, and I'll let uh, Louise maybe talk a bit about that. So over to you, Louise Philip Lopez. Thank you, Iwi, for, for the introduction. So uh, thank you to Maslan and to the organizers for giving me the opportunity to participate in this fabulous event today, the World Bamboo Day. It's a really nice date to have this wonderful event, and I hope all the participants are enjoying the presentations as I am, because I really enjoy the presentations of all the three of you, uh, very interesting topic. So I hope I can fit the expectations of all the participants uh, today. So we'll share my screen. 
um, now, so I can start to talk about uh, uh, the, the, the topic I prepared for all of you today. So today I am going to talk a little bit about bamboo standards and also about our social housing project using bamboo in the Philippines. So let's start with uh, bamboo standards. So let's see this map, the world map, and we can check what is the situation of the bamboo standards in the world uh, right now. So we have uh, uh, first of the most famous standards that everyone is talking always are the ISO standards. So ISO headquarters are located in Switzerland, but there is an important fact about the ISO standards is that the ISO standards has no jurisdiction. So you cannot use it in your country and present to the authorities and say, oh, look, I calculate this structure by using the ISO 22156. And so you have to give me a building permit. That's not possible because ISO standard has no jurisdiction at all in any country. So the way that the ISO standard can be used in a country is that first, the local authorities uh, adopt the ISO standards as, as a national standard and later on be incorporated in the building code. If we are talking about the standard for uh, structural design. But, uh, so you can see that in the, there is two areas in the world where the bamboo standards start to, to, to appear. First is Latin America, so starting with Colombia, Ecuador, Peru, now Mexico and Brazil working on their own standards. And we have Asia where China has a lot of standards for uh, engineer bamboo, laminated bamboo, all these uh, industrial products. India also has its own uh, construction uh, standard. And now Philippines is working in the national standard. So this is more or less the status of the standards around the world. Maybe I forget to put one country. Sometimes some people say me that in Bangladesh also there is a national standard for construction. But anyway, this is more or less the status of the standards around the world. So let's check a little bit the chronology of the development of these standards. So before 2000, there was nothing in the world, nothing. There was not a single standard that can be used for bamboo. So all the bamboo was used in a vernacular way without any quality control or either and neither uh, any standard that can guarantee the quality of those works. So it was in, in 2000 when the ICBO, this is an institution for constructions or something like that in California, create the first a standard for bamboo ever. It was the acceptance criteria for a structural bamboo. This was a standard more for grading than uh, structural analysis or of testing, but that was the seedling for uh, the ISO standard. So that was the beginning of the ISO standards that later on uh, see the light in 2004. But in 2002 in Colombia, Actually, uh, we, we need to come back to 1999 in Colombia. There was a very strong earthquake in an area with a lot of bamboo houses and all these bamboo houses survived very well. So the Colombian government decided to establish a research uh, project to see if the system called Bajareque uh, could be introduced in the national building code. And in 2002, the Bajareque system was introduced in the Colombian National Building Code. And Colombia became the first country in the world that incorporates bamboo in, in, in its National Building Code. So that's a big achievement for Colombia and also for the bamboo construction history. And 2004, ISO uh, published the two first ISO standards, the 22156 for uh, structural analysis and the 22157 for mechanical properties of, of, of bamboo, that means to a standard for make laboratory tests. In 2009, Colombia made its second standard, this one for bamboo structures, three-dimensional trusses, post beam uh, bracing uh, structures with bamboo, more for this spectacular construction that we see in Bali or from Simon Belles. And also in 2009, India incorporated in, in its uh, uh, timber code a chapter for bamboo for vernacular construction, but uh, with the 
problem that there is no formulas to calculate columns of beams, only mechanical properties and some recommendations for connections, but no uh, a, a process of design. So actually the first standard that incorporate a, a, a process that you can use to design an entire structure starting from the foundation, the walls, the connections, the columns, the beams, everything was the title G and the NSR10 uh, in Colombia. That was the first standard that could be used for an entire design of, of a building. In 2010, Peru uh, published the E100 standard. That was a combination of the Colombian Bajareque standard plus the title G from Colombia and also plus some additions of the Colombian, uh, of the Peruvian uh, methodology. So it's, it was a very interesting uh, a new standard with actually more graphic uh, uh, work that is uh, easy to understand. Same situation happened with Ecuador in 2015, where they make their own standard also based in the Colombian standard. And in 2015, the new, uh, the ISO committee uh, resume operations and in 2018 ISO published the, the third standard uh, for bamboo. This is the 19624 for uh, global bamboo grading. So this is a standard for bamboo production. So how you can classify the bamboo if you have a treatment facility, how you can grade your bamboo according with the structural uh, capacity or uh, you can have grade one, grade two, grade or that depending on the quality of the bamboo. So this is to uh, professionalize the production of bamboo uh, in the world. And um, in, the, in last, uh, this year, in, in June, it was the, the, um, the publishing of the new ISO 22156. This is a, a new version of the bamboo structural design standard in, in the ISO. And if you remember in my previous slide here, I mentioned that in 2004, ISO published this standard, but uh, to be honest, uh, at that time, it was uh, a compendium of good intentions. So it was a standard that shows the way that the, uh, the philosophy of the uh, bamboo structural design should follow. But uh, to be honest, you cannot use that standard to design even a column because there was no formulas for that. It was just like the beginning of a, a structural design code. But this new version uh, of the ISO 22156 has been uh, uh, developing for the last four years uh, for a group of, uh, of experts from the US. Professor, Professor Ken Harris from Pittsburgh University was the lead of this uh, project together with David Trujillo from Coventry University. Myself also participated in this in this project, but we have experts from Australia, uh, China, Indonesia. I think Andre also has uh, some involvement in this in this develop. So it was a really international standard, taking uh, knowledge from all the countries, and I will say that is the most modern and the best document that we have created ever for bamboo structural design. And I hope many countries in the world can adopt this, this uh, standard soon. And um, next year, we will have the new Colombian standard, uh, of course, based in the, this new ISO. And we hope also in Philippines, we have the version of the ISO for the Philippines. So you can see here, these are probably just six of the most important standards. We have uh, the three ISO standards for mechanical properties, for structural design, and the grading standard. We have the Peruvian, the Ecuadorian, and also there is Inbar produce a, a, a Andean standard for Bajareque and Cementado that also can be, is again, a, a standard without jurisdiction, but it will be the basis for the new Colombian Bajareque standard. Uh, also, you can see a list of standards here, many of them in Spanish, because in Colombia, there is a very active committee of uh, bamboo standards that have been created, the standards for harvesting, drying, treatment, Unfortunately, most of those standards are in Spanish. So I hope you can translate and you can have access to that because there is more than 10 standards in Colombia for all this process. If you are interested in a structural design, I will recommend you these two standards. These are the best standards for structural design of uh, structures in, in the world. If you are an English speaker, please refer to the ISO 22156. It's a very nice standard, but still need to 
be fit or fit, uh, uh, need to be filled with the information from each country. So probably if you are from, let's say something, Malaysia, and you have a bamboo species that is local, you will not find the uh, uh, design values for that species and this standard because this is global, it's international. So there is an annex that includes data from Guadua from Colombia, Bambusa blumeana from the Philippines, the species that are characterized up to date. But if you don't have characterized your species in, in your country, you have to do that first by using the ISO for uh, structural, uh, for uh, mechanical properties. And if you are a Spanish speaker, I recommend you to use the NSR10, uh, next year NSR22, the Colombian standard that is actually very complete, uh, very easy to understand, and you can use to design any, any, any structure. So there is many different types of standards. We have standards for materials. We have standards for uh, structural design. We have standards for products like uh, laminate bamboo and also for process like uh, drying and treatment. So uh, the, the world has been changed a lot in the last 20 years. And we have now a lot of standards that will uh, help us to produce better bamboo products and align the bamboo construction with other conventional materials like concrete and steel, because that's always a complaint from the uh, from the people that bamboos has not uh, standards. So when we talk about bamboo uh, construction of bamboo structures, this difference I, I know Andrew already show. I want to show a little bit also uh, of this. We have a bamboo frame construction like this one uh, is a element when the bamboo is the main structural component. Uh, we have uh, columns, beams, bracing, everything made of bamboo, very typical in this uh, structure, like this one made by Simon Vélez in Cartagena, Colombia. We have also the bajareque, or uh, we call it here in the Philippines, cement bamboo frame technology. There's many ways to call this technology. And this is a cheer wall system. So here, the walls are the responsible to receive to resist the vertical loads uh, coming from the gravity of the weight of the elements, but also to resist the lateral loads uh, due to uh, earthquakes or typhoons or things like that. So in this uh, uh, technology, in many cases, you even cannot see the bamboos. Bamboos are inside, could be double cladding, so even inside the bamboos. So I, I will show you a little more about this technology. And we have laminated bamboo structures like this one in the Philippines made by Kubo. Uh, process also very interesting or bamboo slats structures like this one for Arquitectura Mista from uh, Jaime Peña from Mexico and Colombia. So there is different ways to use the bamboo and the way you analyze these structures are completely different. So it's not the same way. So I want to talk to you about the origin of the technology that we are using in the Philippines. So we have to go back to Africa probably thousands of years ago when the humans leave the caves, probably the first system that we use ever was the uh, Waterland Dove. So it's a system that uh, you can see that this is not made in, in bamboo, it's made in, in, in wood and branches, uh, branches of, of wood, but it's the origin of the system that today we are using. So and even in Europe, you can see this is the uh, house where William Shakespeare grew up. It's a house with probably 500 years old. And you can see that it's a timber house, but the walls of this house are made with the same system of these huts in, in South Africa. So it's a, a, a branches, mud, it's water and dove system. And this system has an evolution for uh, many years, even reaching Philippines when we have the uh, Tabique Pampango that was used by the Spaniards to build convents and, and churches in the country. Use the same concept of this uh, weaving, in this case, bamboo slats, plastered with mud and, and other components to make buildings. In Colombia, in the coffee region, we have like a explosion of this system. So all these colorful houses you're looking here in the beautiful town of Finlandia, Quindío in Colombia, are made of bamboo, but this is bamboo using these techniques of plastering with mud and in and, and some cases with cement when they have access, and they were able to make this, this kind of, of construction. So this kind of construction were very popular in other countries like Ecuador. This is the typical construction in Colombia, 
in Ecuador. This is after an earthquake, so you see some of the walls uh, a little damaged, but they have survived the strong earthquake. And you can see part of the of the bamboo uh, weaving that was used to support the cluster. And even in, in, in the center downtown of Lima, they have a system called Quincha that is very similar using also timber, mud, and some weavings using bamboo fibers and bamboo slats. So, and you can see houses of 400, even more years. In Colombia, the technology continue evolving. And when the people of this region had, has access to cement, they, they use cement to cover the walls, even making three-story buildings and things like that. They remove the, the mud inside the walls. So they start to use esterilla or flattened bamboo to carry the plaster. So you can see many of these examples. So we get the inspiration of this technology in Best Baha'i. So Best Baha'i uh, is a foundation uh, located in the Philippines, uh, fully funded by the Hilti Foundation from Europe. And our main objective is to build social housing by using local materials and sustainable materials. So we started in 2011, making some research and to, uh, about the mechanical properties of the bamboo. And later on, we start to do some projects in the, in the country. Uh, the reason uh, Hilti Foundation chose Philippines is because uh, the Philippines is a, a country with many natural disasters, plus it's a country with a lot of poverty and, and, their, and their people. So, in the beginning, we decide to test the local species. The most common here is the Bambusa blumeana. Uh, and we decide to make mechanical properties, connections, and even bareke walls to see if we can use this species to replicate the Colombian uh, system because we already have the standards in Colombia. So we don't want to start from scratch in the Philippines. We want to use something that was easy to implement. Uh, also, one of the big questions here was, can the Bareke system resist typhoons? In Colombia, we don't have typhoons, only in an island, very north part of the country, but in the continental territory, we don't have typhoons. So we, to, to answer that question, we built these three houses in Inobatan, Albay, in a province, when every year, you know, Philippines has 20 typhoons every year, and maybe four or five of those typhoons could be super typhoons. So more than 250 kilometers per hour. So we locate these houses in one of these areas when you can have uh, one of these monster typhoons. And uh, we have to wait only for eight months until the first typhoon hit the house. Typhoon Glenda hit it in 2014. And we have some equipment, satellite at weather station where we can measure the, 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 the wind speed. And at the end, uh, the houses resist 220 kilometers per hour without any problem. But up to date, these three houses have received five typhoons, all of them super typhoons of category four, more than 200 kilometers per hour, without any damage to report. So at the end, we came with a system, construction system that is typhoon resistant, earthquake resistant, fire resistance, as, as Andy mentioned, we made some fire tests also with two hours of fire resistant, and of course, insect resistance. So we develop our own treatment method. And with all this information, we apply to the National Housing Authority for the accreditation of innovative technologies for housing, uh, or, or ITEC, how it's called here in the Philippines. And we get it uh, three years ago, and with that, we can apply for building permits. So our construction system is very simple. It's just a conventional foundation and concrete with some dough wells that we use later on to connect the bamboo walls. We elevate, of course, the, bamboo, the, the, the foundation from the ground to guarantee that there is no problems with humidity. We prefabricate the frames that later on are installed on top of the foundation and cover with a metallic mesh called grid lat that is especially used for carry the plaster. The plaster is just two centimeters. And at the end, you will see a house that looks like a concrete house that help us also to fight against the stigma of the bamboo being the poor, poor man's timber. We have built more than 1,000 homes all around the Philippines. And we have uh, just last year, we started our first international project in Nepal with 34 houses, and this year, another 70 houses. So we are expanding this technology to other countries. Um, but we don't use only for social housing. We have orphanage. Uh, the treatment facilities are all made in bamboo. We have community centers for these families that we support. 
our most ambitious project is uh, the uh, coalition 2025 already with the Habitat for Humanity and Health Foundation when we expect to build 10,000 homes with this technology in the Negros Occidental province here in the Philippines. So finally, uh, I just want to, uh, uh, time is over, but I want to tell you that here in BASE, we create the BASE Innovation Center. It's a laboratory to research uh, sustainable construction materials, materials, but especially uh, bamboo. And we have alliances with local and international universities in Malaysia, for example, we have an alliance with uh, the Mara uh, University, University of Technology of Mara. Uh, together with them, we will start the characterization of the Malaysia, Malaysian uh, bamboos. And we have very nice universities like the ETH Zurich, Hong Kong Science and Technology. Uh, we have alliance with Aruk. And then in the laboratory, we test mechanical properties. And also, we support research in other countries, like in Colombia, Malaysia, or whatever. So we want to train people, we want to develop technologies that are optimal for each country, and we want to create better homes for, for the people. So that's all. Thank you very much for your attention. This is the information about Best Baha'i. If you want to contact us, and let's go to the questions. Thank you very much. Thank you, Luis. Thank you for your presentation. We are now... I think gonna move on to the questions. Is there anything else that uh, any of the panel want to raise first before we go on to the questions or the organizers? What we have done is, um, <clears throat> speakers, can you turn on your mics and your videos if you can, thank you, thanks. Um, we have tried to answer some of the questions um, by typing them out. Uh, if you look at the Q&A panel, you can open the Q&A panel, guys. At the bottom of the screen, you can see that um, we've answered 18, and there are 18 open questions to go through. And let's, let's go through that. We have about half an hour, and I'm going to direct some of the more like mentioned questions. First to Andre. Andre, um, question from Ray. Ray hi, Ray. Um, Ray is from Kawaiian Collective in the Philippines. Ray has asked, um, how old is your oldest plastered bamboo structure? What maintenance issues are the most common in the houses? What learnings have you had in the early iterations um, that you have applied in the more recent construction projects, Andre? Yeah, the first bamboo, plastered bamboo construction that have been built in 1999. So it's already almost uh, more than 20 years, yeah. And it still stands, uh, stay still. Uh, stand still. And the issue of my plastered bamboo construction was uh, the crack. Yeah. But uh, cracks happen if, uh, even if we, if we use uh, masonry construction, we have crack also. So I think uh, it's really difficult to avoid the crack in the, in the wall, uh, especially if we use the uh, bamboo as a reinforcement inside this, uh, this plastering. But to reduce this one, uh, I combining with with uh, chicken wire. So maybe I, I hope that the last project in Malang, which used the ferrous man structure, uh, maybe uh, Luis can uh, have their own a better experience about this. Mm, but I hope in using the ferrous man, is it will reduce uh, a lot of crack in in the wall. Yeah, and there is no much ma maintenance for that. Yeah, it's just like a like an ordinary masonry construction. Mm. I think uh, for both Luis and for for Andre as well, there are quite a few questions on the type of cement that's used or concrete, as people are asking. Maybe we can explain a bit more about what is actually applied to the walls, right? This these uh, structured walls. What is applied because there's also a question on mud as well, right? Can we use mud instead or, or mud cement? Uh, yeah, basically, I would like uh, trying to use the mud. Yeah, mud combining with bamboo is going to be a, an ideal, an, an ideal uh, in terms of sustainability. Uh, but it's very unfortunate that I haven't had that kind of experience before. But I would like, I would love to do that. 
yeah in my opinion the ideal ways of of course yeah using the uh, bamboo construction uh, using bamboo as a skeleton and then combining with mud as plastering uh, so it's going to be a, a perfect idea so far i use like uh, i use still the mortar combining cement with sand with the proportional of uh, one cement uh, compared to uh, four or five uh, sand that's the thing that I've done so far. Yeah, in, in our case, uh, we, we use also uh, uh, mortar cement uh, and we would like to use other things. I mean, we know that by using less cement, we can reduce the carbon emissions and the carbon footprint of, of the house. Right now, a house, like any conventional house of Best Baha'i, it has 60% uh, less carbon emissions than a conventional concrete uh, brick house. So it's a big achievement, but we, we like to have less. Unfortunately, if we start to use uh, mud instead of, of plaster, that, uh, that has a consequences that the, the, the mud requires more maintenance in the future. And then uh, we are giving these houses to the poorest of the poor people of the Philippines. This is people that are on their, on their line of misery. That means they live with less than two or one dollar per day. And uh, if we give them a house that in two or three years requires any kind of maintenance, they will be not able to do that because they have to get the money for the food and they are not going to uh, spend their food money making the maintenance of the house. So the plaster has also that advantage. It's more resistant and it creates houses that are uh, maintenance less to say something I mean and and then uh, uh, that's one of the reasons so once we can found a mixture with mud that don't require any maintenance in the long term we will use it for sure because uh, we are not happy to use this amount of cement but uh, it's something that we, we we are working in the innovation center so we that is one of the reasons we have the Innovation Center here in Manila, is to test all these new materials and found solution, find solutions for that. Great, thank you. Thank you. There are more questions coming in, a lot of questions coming in. Thank you, guys. Thank you, everyone. Um, I want to direct the next question to Ahmad Maslan. Um, quite a few questions on treatment. Uh, uh, the more popular questions would be what treatment is best, what is the best treatment for bamboo right, to increase the lifespan of bamboo, Amar Masla? Yeah, uh, I mean, the way that I see it is that my favorite one is the modified luxury because you don't need so much chemical and you don't waste and you don't have residual, you know? Yeah, that means you don't have a problem to, to dispose it later on. You know? uh, the next one is my, my preferred one is the horizontal soap. That means you have a large tank you soak the bamboo with the percentage of boron, 6% or 10%. But this is easy method because you don't have to use palm or anything. Huh? You just put inside the tank yeah, and submerge it. Then after two weeks, you take it out. Huh? So you drain, take it out. So it's easy. Only thing that after like six or seven cycles, the, the solution becomes very stinky, huh? very bad smell, very foul smell. Huh? So some, uh, sometimes it, that you know, unbearable smell. <laughs> So you have to dispose it, and I'm referring to the environmental bamboo foundation. The, the way of disposing it is by diluting a lot of water, and you just discharge it, and you can just measure it as long as you achieve you, you 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 dilute it to standard one that is according to our nature and requirement. Then you just release it to open water. So that's the thing. Yeah. But if you give me the choice, I would prefer to go on modified washery. Yeah. Only thing that multi virtually limitation is that you have to treat it immediately after you harvest. You cannot pile it up a lot, no? Then you have to treat it within four hours. So that's the thing. And the cheapest is modified virtually, my, my personal experience. Only thing, a little bit of initial capital investment, they have to buy some, some tools and machine. <coughs> that's all, yeah. Okay, pa, Maslan, also there's some questions on using the transpiration method, right? Um, how long and how far how many meters up okay. the, uh, the liquid goes? This one's a post, post transfusion method, method, this one. I think it's more like if you want to use DIY, small scale, it's okay. But for commercial, it's not, it's not, it's not wide, it's not wide, it's not wide for commercial. Side is you know, be effective as well, right? Yeah, yeah, because, so you, you, you have to prepare, you can use a recycle, recycle bottle, no? a drinking bottle, and you put up the, the, your, your chemical solution there, your preservative inside there. 
you cut the bamboo and just put food inside it without without telling down the, the, the bamboo crumb. Then you, then you chop up until the, the bamboo crumb stop sucking in anymore. And the, 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 the level of uh, preservative does not lower anymore, stop there. And you then don't do that anymore. And you just let the, the plant to dry off. Then it will keep basically until the end, until the branches or so, but it will continue. And normally it takes like two weeks, three weeks, it will, it will dry off. Eh? So that's the that's I really recommend for villagers who want to do with less uh, and less cost of buying the preservative and all that. Okay, but um, also another one on, on treatment about uh, the bushery. What should the PSI requirement be and how two long? Bar. Do we use two bar, yeah. Two bar. Two bar, because, two bar yeah, pressure. Yeah, okay. two bar pressure. If you use lesser than that, also can. Even if you, use, you don't have a farm, you can just use, use gravitational, you know? You put your tank on a high ground. Mm. For how long? Down, For how long? But take longer time. <laughs> longer time. But if you use a uh, full bar pressure, my personal experience with this uh, small time, it takes less than one hour per cycle, you know, complete, you know, until you get a very good uh, colored solution coming out at the end. So, but if you use gravitational, maybe it takes days, you know, maybe two days, three days for you to complete you know, because the pressure is low. All right, thank you. Thanks. Can I also ask the speakers to have a look at the questions? There are now about 34 questions. Um, maybe you can pick up the ones you want to answer. Some of them are quite specific to, to the actual speaker. So maybe, um, Andre, maybe you can pick one and see which one you want to answer. That might be good. Okay, the cost per square meter for your house. Uh, this is for you, Bully. Okay, uh, <clears throat> the reason, uh, maybe I, I the the first prototype of bamboo houses uh, cost um, uh, 36 square meters. It costs only 15 million rupiah. I don't know, but it's in 1999. Yeah, so it's uh, quite cheap. Uh, the last uh, bamboo structure that I've built in, in Malang cost approximately uh, 20. 20, uh, sorry, it's uh, around six to four meters. Uh, and we have the mezzanine also, uh, and it costs uh, approximately 20 million rupiah. So yeah, that, that's the cost. So I don't know. Yeah, it's just, uh, yeah. Um, great, great. Uh, Luis, have you got any, any uh information that you want to share on costs for your housing as well, roughly? Yeah, well, I, I didn't mention anything about cost, but um, I just want to tell you that, for example, if we compare our, our houses with conventional houses made of uh, concrete hollow blocks, following the regulations, meaning houses that can resist earthquakes and typhoons, we are 17% to 20% lower in cost. So the system could be cheaper than conventional. And we are very confident that if we improve some of our process, we can reduce that percentage even more. Uh, that gives us uh, an average of 160 to 170 US dollars per square meter. Great, great. Um, there's a few more questions on, on earthquake and on wind, quite a few of that as usual the effect of earthquake and wind on bamboo buildings, right? Um, anyone wants to take on this one? Yeah, this I think uh, they're, they're, um, when you build with bamboo, you have many advantages against earthquakes because bamboo is light, it's very resistant and, and it's flexible. So uh, normally a house made of bamboo, uh, the weight of that house is two, even three times less than a concrete house. So when you have an earthquake, there is two factors that you need to have in mind. First is the mass of the building, and second is the acceleration due to the earthquake. The acceleration you cannot control. It's coming from the nature, so it's impossible to, to modify. But the mass of the building is under your control. You decide which materials use. You decide what is the material of the roof, the walls, what you want to use. So if you make a house that has less mass, so the forces uh, involved in that house during an earthquake are less. So you, by using bamboo, you're reducing the mass of your house. So uh, the, the, it's an automatic 
advantage uh, compared with other matillas. That doesn't mean you, you don't need to calculate or connect well the elements. It's not just put bamboo and everything is solved. You need to do it technically correct. And regarding uh, typhoons, it's, it's, it's a little uh, different. And against typhoons, you need a light construction, uh, sorry, a heavy construction that can resist the, 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 the winds and the house will not uh, just fly uh, to the space. So in our case, with the cement bamboo frame, we found a system that is like in the middle range of weight. So it's not too heavy for the earthquakes, so works very well for the earthquakes, but it's not too light for the typhoons, so it can stay in, in its position during the typhoon. So we need to find that balance, and I think the Bahariki and the cement bamboo frame technology or the plaster uh, uh, construction that Andy shows uh, can work very well for these environments when you have typhoons and earthquakes together or wherever you have. Uh, Andre, any, any comment on for wind and for earthquakes? Yeah, I think that's all for Luis Lopez from the expert. Yes, yeah. so uh, <laughs> I do agree with that 100%. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. 200 uh, please. <laughs> uh, no, we don't have similar experience like our friend in Indonesia and in Philippines about that matter. I just want to add a little bit on the earlier about how much the building then the building cost. Maybe young, that maybe young, ask, asking that question in Malaysia, you know. So my personal experience that it's not cheaper than normal other conventional material. So it's, it's a simple basic design. It's about the same. You know? So, so that's why sometimes people wanted to very good, uh, very good high end design. And eventually, when we calculate the cost, then they shy away. <laughs> so, so that is the problem that we face. Huh? So, people thought that bamboo is cheap. It's not cheap really because in Malaysia, we don't have the plantation yet. We have to harvest from the jungle. Harvesting that bamboo from the jungle is expensive, logistic, and all that manpower. And another thing is that. Uh, for bamboo, you need skilled workers. No? That's why the distribution of cost for bamboo construction is 60% for the labor and 40% for the material. So the labor is expensive. So, so I can say that you can have a simple basic uh, bamboo house at a price of same like conventional. It's no more, not cheaper than, than conventional material. So that's it. Yeah. Yeah, I, I do agree. I do agree with, with in terms of cost that for bamboo buildings. When you compare cost of bamboo buildings with conventional uh, construction, it is either equal or sometimes more. Um, yeah. Usually it's not less unless you're talking about very basic buildings. Um, that is because of uh, the bamboo as well, the bamboo, the treatment, and also mainly, as Ahmad Maslan says, because of the lack of skills in a lot of countries. Um, in Indonesia, uh, with Andri, and myself, we, we have the fortunate uh, competitiveness as well to get some of the pricing down. Uh, you can actually go to quote, uh, to get quotes from for buildings in Indonesia because there are so many uh, builders around and artisans that it can become competitive and slowly the market can become more mature, but it does take time. Um, in terms of earthquakes and wind, I would also like to add, uh, correct me if I'm wrong, guys, I'm not an engineer, you both are, or three of you are, um, I'm only an architect, but um, I think the joint design, how you connect the bamboo, whether it's earthquake or typhoons, is also very critical. I think that is your part, uh, your specialist area, Andre. Um, mm -hmm. If you do that right, quite a lot of the problem is solved, right? Uh, re regardless of weight or or the actual form of your building. Yeah, I, I do agree. I do agree uh, that uh, that's why I I trying I'm trying in the in the in the, the near future. I hope I can also use my very high tensile strength of bamboo joint to develop this uh, kind of structure, which uh, strong enough against the not only the earthquake because the problem with with the earthquake maybe it's quite easier to be solved by bamboo, but for the mm -hmm. hurricane because it's a lot of, uh, yeah, like blowing up. So we need something that anchored to the base very, very good. And that's why maybe my, my connection will, will, will have a lot of advantages in, in, this, in this kind of uh, condition. Mm, thank you, I, thank I you. Will, uh, if we add something um, to what Andre say is, 
Well, another factor that helps a lot in the earthquake uh, resistance is the symmetry. When you have buildings that are more sy symmetrical design, mm -hmm. those buildings have some better behavior than you have very regular shapes that have a lot of torsional problems during the earthquake. So that's the eternal fight between engineers and architects. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I think, I think uh, as I've replied to one of the answers, this is a very specialist area and we really cannot generalize, right? Because there's so many factors that affect it in terms of an earthquake, in terms of a typhoon or cyclone. Many, many factors affect whether your building can stand up, right? Um, and, and we cannot generalize too much. Um, it is very specialist. And if you really want an earthquake or typhoon proof building, uh, you need specialists and you need really detailed study on it. Right? It cannot just happen by just Googling and trying to do it on your own. That's what I would say to be safe. Yeah, thank you. Um, I'm going to direct the next one to, to Luis from, from Giuseppe. I'm a big fan of your pioneering work at Base Baha'i. I have a question aside from providing sustainable houses. Do you envision or aim to be like Ibuku Studio in Bali? providing innovative bamboo architecture in the Philippines, like schools, hotels, and gymnasiums. Um, but it's not part of our main objective. Of course, we, we made some different structures like this orphanage and, and, and community centers, but most of our work uh, remains in the social sector. No? So, so we, we are not the uh, ambition to build resorts and things like that because it's not part of our main objective. So, so I, I, don't, I don't see Base Baha'i uh, becoming something like Kiboku in the Philippines. No, we are in different sectors and our objectives are completely different. Actually, I see more uh, complementary work between Ibuku that they are in, in other sectors and we that are in research and, 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 and social sector. So, but, but no, no, we are not in that way, definitely. <laughs> um, there's a question that's just come up from Ake Dion. There are some beautiful organic designs being constructed in Indonesia, for example, in Lombok. I'm very interested to know what state of play is about the use of glass in combination with these organic constructions. Are there experiences about the issues on combination when applying these methods? Um, I'll try to answer that. Um, yes, bamboo can be successfully combined with all other conventional materials, glass, timber, steel, masonry, concrete. Um, not a lot has been done successfully. People are still experimenting. You can see a lot online of, of how all these can be applied but there needs to be more study of how junctions between bamboo and other materials work because bamboo is organic. Bamboo is not straight like a manufactured uh, plank or, or steel, right? We have to know how to then deal with these intersections and engagements. And this is an ongoing work, if you like, um, that makes bamboo, makes the bamboo sector so interesting, right? how it's going to re-emerge as the poor man's timber to go into become a solid competitor with timber as it gets more scarce, more expensive, with steel, aluminum, as this earth material that's being dug up will be less and less and even more expensive. Right? How can bamboo then be a substitute? And how can we then combine, hopefully with recycled or repurposed materials like has been mentioned, right? successfully do it. Um, anyone else wants to contribute? Yeah, in maybe in my house, I, I, I use bamboo also and combining with, with, uh, with the glass, but I use uh, timber frame as a connector between bamboo and, and the glass. So it's not directly uh, attaching bamboo to the glass, but I, I use still, uh, still I, I still use the, the timber frame for that. Okay. Um, a question from Omar Cairo. Is there any provision to connect bamboo comb using structural silicon sealant 
instead of using the lashing or bolted joint? Maybe in your in your case, uh, I have no I, I have no uh, experience on that. Yeah, maybe in your case, you Eugene, uh, in in green school, is that is it, is it common to to use that or? Um, I've never seen structural silicon in green school. It's almost like a, a naughty <laughs> material. It's banned. <laughs> <laughs> um, perhaps in where glass is used. And then I think it's a very good compliment, right? Uh, to seal glass to glass. Yeah, yeah. But mm. you start using silicon sealant on two types of different materials. I think the, the coefficient is different and the chance of it opening it up or leaking is very high. Yeah. yeah. I don't think it's, it, will, uh, it will attach yeah, the silicon to the, to the bamboo skin. I don't uh, think. Yeah. yeah, I think so. How about you other guys? Uh, Ahmad Mazlan and Luis, any experience with using silicon? With I don't know. Know. I don't know. Yeah. 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 I use epoxy to, to when you greenwash the bamboo to bend it, you know, you use epoxy to 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 put to plant together the, the notch you know, for bending of bamboo. Okay. The next question we always get, guys. I think we agree. We always get this question uh, on many of our talks, right? All of you give many talks, and this is about fire rating, right? We always get asked about bamboo and fire rating. I'm surprised only one or two questions. Normally, there's like five or six guys saying, hey, bamboo, fire rating, wow. <laughs> so, you know, anyone wants to tackle that first? Well, okay, I, I, will, I will say that yes, it's an issue. Fire is an issue when you build with bamboo or even with uh, timber. But wait, bamboo, uh, fire is also an issue if you build with the steel. And actually, it's worse if you build with the steel than if you build with wood or bamboo. So if you go yeah. to US, to UK, or, or to other countries, and you will have a warehouse made of steel and another uh, warehouse made of wood, the warehouse with the steel pay more uh, insurance rate than the warehouse made in timber. And the reason is because the steel lose its structural capacity very quickly uh, with uh, high temperatures. And the bamboo and, and, the, and, the, and, the, um, and the wood, uh, even if they start to burn, they keep the structural capacity for more time than the steel. Now, with bamboo, we have one additional problem: is that we don't have too much material in the in the in the columns. So uh, the bamboo take more time to start to to burn than wood because the silica that protects the exterior. But once the bamboo start to burn, there's nothing that we can do. It, it will consume so quickly. So uh, in our case, the way we fight against that problem is by using the plaster with, with cement. So we have these walls that are double plaster that we tested with Andri and Lily there in, in Bogor University. And, and we expose these walls with double plaster, plastering uh, to the, the ISO standard for fire ratings to see uh, what is the time that the fire needs to cross the wall or to start to burn the elements inside the wall. And then those tests that we conducted like four years ago, we were able to determine that a bamboo wall plaster with, with cement can last even two hours. And I think, uh, Andre, you can complement the information with your other tests. Yeah, yeah, I already mentioned also in my presentation, but I didn't put the, the previous, uh, previous slide about the uh, walling system from from the base Baha'i. Yeah? We did also the that kind of walling system and then uh, testing in, in the fire and it passed two hours. What I've showed in this case using my uh, system of plastered bamboo construction and it's still the same, it, uh, it uh, passed two hours of fire rating. So it means that, yeah, we are safely going out from the, from the structure, yeah, uh, before it collapsed. Uh, of course, if we use uh, uh, exposed bamboo like my house, yeah, that's there's the issue about about uh, about the fire. But yeah, <laughs> yeah I, I just want to add something. Yeah, yeah. Um, there is also elements that will create more fire in the construction. So, if for example, I have a touched roof uh, with uh, natural fibers. If that cash fire your building is is gone, it doesn't matter the material the structure is. Your building is gone. So 
So the, you need to take sort of precautions also against fire with the materials that you use in other components of, of your of your house. But of course, a bamboo fully made in, a house fully made in bamboo, uh, you need to take additional precautions that like use some kind of coat to retard the spread of the fire in the elements, uh, uh, water sprinklers that protect the, 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 the structure, but, but can be controlled. There is ways. Yeah, but even in traditional way of construction, there are a lot of kitchen with open fire using bamboo structure, right? In traditional way of construction. And uh, maybe because of they are very uh, aware of that uh, and it, it's, yes, yeah, it's, it's, they stay, stay safe, yeah. Uh, using open fire in, in the kitchen, but they are the, the, the building made of, or the kitchen made of uh, bamboo. Okay, okay, thank you guys. We are, we are sort of coming to our closing time now. Um, really very quick, two words, three words, farewell to everyone. Thank you speakers. Maybe I can go through before I hand it back. Um, Pak Maslan, you wanna say your farewell very quickly? Yeah, yeah. I mean, we are we are behind Indonesia and Philippines, Thailand, right? this region in terms of bamboo construction. So, but we are catching up fast, <laughs> inshallah. And also that uh, my bamboo journey, I say that one day I wanted to see bamboo being, being sold at the hardware shop. No? Now you cannot. You want to have bamboo poles, you have to be jung go to jungle and harvest. No? So like in Indonesia, Thailand, they have they, they are selling bamboo, treated bamboo and the hardware shop. <laughs> Thank you, thank you, Pa. Thank you. Thanks, um, Luis. Hey, thank you for for the opportunity. This was an amazing time sharing with all of you experience and and comments. I hope all the attendees enjoy uh, the effort that we made to prepare all these presentations and to share this information with all of you. So hope we can repeat uh, an event like this soon. Thank you, thank you, Pandri. Yeah, thank you very much for the opportunity opportunity to talk in this uh, event. Yeah, I hope that all of uh, our presentation here with all the panelists here will give you a better overview of bamboo and just using bamboo. Start using, start using bamboo, and you you have uh, you have also the effect, the better effect to the to our environment. Yeah, bam because bamboo is grows to be used, not like a tree. It can be uh, put it in the jungle for hundreds of years, but bamboo, you need to use it. Yeah, if you have the bamboo on, on, on your uh, backyard, use it. After it's already mature enough, use it, start using, and we will contribute a lot to our uh, better environment. Thank you very much. Thank you, thank you, Andre. Yes, bamboo is re-emerging. Join us, join us in our bamboo journey with this uh, green gold, this golden grass, yeah. go bamboo. Thank you, thank you. I'll hand it back to Dr. Sri Maslan. Thank you all. Thank you. Hope next time we can see in person. Yes, we hope, hope so. to meet in person. <laughs> yes, that, that's what we hope. So, thank you. Thank you, Eugene. Thank you, Luis. Thank you, Andre. And thank you, Ahmad Maslan for that very, very constructive and very informative session. I mean, there were so many questions. I think uh, even if we went on for another half an hour, um, we would still be uh, very engaged. Um, but uh, we will make the recording of this um, webinar available uh, and also all the PowerPoints. So with those PowerPoints, you'll see, I'm talking to the participants now, all the PowerPoints will contain the information you need of the, the speakers. So this high interest and so many questions, I, this is, I suppose, a very, very good indication of um, how Bamboo has um, come, uh, has emerged, as, um, as Eugene says, and I hope that the future is bright. And so I, I will wrap up by saying that future construction techniques are, are critical as um, each, of, each of our speaker um, engaged in, in that one way or another. But I think most importantly is that we must have standards, uh, standards that will address, again, uh, how you construct the, the, the buildings, uh, how you address uh, fire risks, uh, preservations, and all that. But in my mind too, 
uh, one thing that is uh, cannot be underestimated is training. I think uh, we have not um, touched on how we're going to get training uh, out there um, because it is extremely crucial. We need people with skills and enough numbers so that the, the building of uh, bamboo, uh, construction of bamboo building become more affordable. I think as some, um, Ahmad Mazlan mentioned that the lack of labor and all that increases the cost of um, bamboo buildings, which to me is a little bit of an oxymoron. You, you use bamboo so that you can have sustainable housing, uh, you know, sus um, housing that is relatively inexpensive. I'm not saying cheap, but inexpensive. But if you have labor costs that are higher than uh, for building of a normal, build, uh, normal construction, it's a little bit, um, I think, an, an issue we must address. So again, as I said, we have been um, very much informed by this, uh, our panelists here. I would like to take this uh, opportunity on your behalf uh, to warmly thank all of them. And I don't think this should be the end of our engagement um, in Bamboo, especially when we talk about SDG 11. So we will continue. Again, I'd like to thank uh, everyone. Uh, maybe Alia, uh, is that uh, maybe you might want to tell the audience they have asked you several questions here. Just reassure them that we will provide uh, what they want. Thank you, Alia. Thank you. Um, thank you, Prof. Maslan. And thank you to all our panelists, our moderator, Eugene especially, um, and all the audience who've come from across the world, really. Some people have been watching this at 4 a.m where they are, so that's brilliant. Um, just to reassure you, after the webinar, at least the day after, we'll be sending the recording of this webinar to you with a link to where you can download all the presentations. Um, and you'll find all the information of the panelists there. Uh, so I hope that can reassure you. Um, and last but not least, I'd just like to remind you all that this is a pre-conference event um, for our conference, which we're holding in uh, October 2021. It's a multidisciplinary conference, so it covers areas not just in architecture and engineering, but also other things like medicine and agriculture. Um, so if you're interested in this uh, conference, you can visit the website, which is tropsc2021.com.my. Um, and as I said earlier, this is a webinar series, so we have more webinars upcoming um, on many different topics. So if you're interested, uh, follow us on social media for more updates. So we have one on marine resources, one on biodiversity loss, and one for the youth. So we're covering all bases here. Um, so thank you again. I'd like to thank everyone for coming. And um, I'll end it with, with saying a uh, happy World Bamboo Day. Thanks, everyone. Thank you, guys. Thank you. Bye-bye. Cheers.